Good Sunday morning. This will be our Sunday school study for uh, Sunday, April 26th, 2020. Um, we're in the book of Revelation, chapter 3, and today we're going to look at what the Lord says to the church in the first century city of Laodicea. Laodicea was a very wealthy city. Uh, it, it even had its own medical school, which was something very rare at the time. It was also decorated with many works of art that were commissioned by its wealthy inhabitants. It was, for the time, a center of science, culture, and wealth. So keeping this in mind, let's start in Revelation 3, verse 14, which says, And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. When addressing the church in Laodicea, Jesus identifies himself with words that should have reminded them of his authority and his nature. Some have claimed that this verse teaches that Jesus was created, that he was God's first creation. Uh, and this, of course, is based on that phrase, the beginning of the creation of God. However, such a position ignores both linguistics and the rest of Scripture. In Colossians 1.15, uh, we read of Christ that he is the image of the invisible God, clearly identifying him as the creator. John 1.1 1, 1 says of him, the word was with God and the word was God. Some have also tried to twist the meaning of John 1.1 1, 1, uh, by making it say the word was a God. But this demonstrates a lack of understanding or perhaps a deliberate misrepresentation of Greek grammar. Uh, in Greek, when there is an equative statement, one saying this is that or this was that, uh, one thing is another basically, the subject of the sentence is identified by having the article, or as we would call it in English, the determiner. Thus, the word, because it's got the word, is uh, the subject. And since um, the subject generally goes at the beginning of the sentence in English, that's where they put it in our translation. That's, that's how we're used to it. However, in the Greek language, uh, the word order is actually this. It literally says, God was the word. Uh, in Koine Greek, uh, the writer would show which word was to be emphasized by placing it at the beginning of the sentence. So John 1.1 1, 1 actually says most emphatically, the word was God. Um, uh, so, so having established that, Let's get back to Revelation 3. Uh, Jesus identifies himself as the Amen. Now, uh, Amen is actually from a Hebrew word that's originally pronounced Amin, and uh, it's the word for truth. So Jesus starts off reminding them that he is not only a teacher of truth, but rather he is the truth. He then calls himself the faithful and true witness. During his earthly ministry, uh, Jesus was the only person in human history who was completely faithful to the Father. These things should have gotten the Laodiceans' attention. Then we come to that term, the beginning of the creation of God. Since we know that Jesus is one with the Father, that he is the creator, uh, the image of the invisible God, what does this statement mean? Well, the word translated beginning in Greek, uh, I'm sorry, is, is a Greek word which had a couple of, of very different applications. Uh, it was used to denote the beginning of something, but when applied to a person, it was used to denote authority, a position over others. In Luke 12, 11, it is translated magistrates. In Luke 20, 20, it is translated power in reference to the governor. In Ephesians 1, 21, Ephesians 3, 10, and Ephesians 6, 12, it is translated as principalities. 
So Revelation 3.14 does not teach that Jesus was the first created being. It teaches that he has authority over all creation. Um, let's go on to verses 15 and 16. He says to the church in Laodicea, I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. It's commonly taught that Hot here means fervently faithful, and cold means the opposite of that. Uh, however, um, if cold were to mean unfaithful, uncaring towards God, why would Jesus say he wishes they were that way? He said, I, I were that you were cold or hot. So uh, why would he want them to be um, unfaithful? Uh, obviously, he wouldn't. So we have to understand that what we have here are two positives. Hot water, especially from natural hot springs, was considered to be beneficial to promote good health. And that would have been something probably the people in Laodicea with their medical institute uh, you know, had heard about. Um, Jesus uh, also said that they weren't cold. Now, cold water was considered and is still considered today to be refreshing. So Jesus found this church to be neither beneficial to anyone nor refreshing. Instead, they were like lukewarm water. Now, uh, in the warmer months, I love to grab a bottle of really cold water. In fact, I often place a, a bottle of water in the freezer for a while so that it will be really cold and refreshing. And yes, sometimes I forget about it and it becomes a bottle of ice. Um, but the point is, because it's refreshing, the colder it is, the more attractive that is. Um, as for hot water... I can remember when I was a kid, when I had a cold, my mom would heat up some water on the stove and she'd put a little bit of Vicks Vapor Rub in it and put it on the table in front of me and usually put a towel over my head and the steam would come up and, and it, would, it would clear my stuffy nose. So we can see hot water can be useful. Um, well, what about lukewarm water? How memorable is that? Who, who just feels totally refreshed when they have a drink of lukewarm water? Or how would lukewarm water help to unstuff your nose? You see, um, lukewarm water is not very memorable or useful. So the church in Laodicea is likened unto that. That church had become useless. It was neither fervent nor refreshing. So Jesus says, I'll spew you out of my mouth. That's a pretty serious warning. Now, these words are coming from the one who is the ultimate authority, from the one who is the very embodiment of truth. No church should ever be comfortable with the idea that Christ would say he would spew them out of his mouth. No church should be comfortable to be useless regarding why a church exists. Uh, and so, of course, that begs the question, why does a church exist? And the answer is, is actually very simple and can be found in Scripture. The answer is, a church exists to spread the gospel and to instruct believers in Jesus Christ, encourage them into truth. Uh, in Matthew 28, we have what we commonly call the Great Commission. It was given by Jesus to his disciples who were part of that first church. And in, in verses 19 and 20 there we read, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. Now, back to Laodicea. In verse 18 of Revelation 3, Jesus gives them counsel. He tells them what they need to do. And in verse 17, he introduces why they need to do what verse 18 says. Uh, Revelation 3.17 says, Because thou sayest, I am rich, 
and increased with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. That's their state. That's what they need to be aware of. That is going to be their motivation for taking the action that he gives them uh, directions to take. Now remember, Laodicea was a very wealthy city, and it appears that the church members there had some of that wealth. Uh, what they tended to say about themselves was, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. How different that is from what is said of the church in Smyrna in, in Revelation 2, 9, where, where the Lord says, I know thy works and tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. The church in Smyrna was rich in faith. The church in Laodicea was rich in material wealth. And apparently, they were very comfortable and not very concerned about the things of God. So, Christ describes them this way. He says, Thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. They may have been materially very rich, but spiritually they were in sad shape. So, Jesus then gives them counsel in Revelation 3.18, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. And anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. Now, gold that has been tried in the fire is the purest. You put gold uh, in the fire and it burns off the impurities. So what these people needed, for one thing in their lives, was purity. And they needed to, to, to understand what that was from the Lord. Um, having Living a pure life before the Lord is always far more valuable than all of the world's riches combined. White, white raiment or clothing uh, is mentioned too. And in Revelation 19, that is equated with the righteousness or literally the righteous deeds of the saints. Uh, the mention of eye salve is interesting since the city had a medical institution. But what these people needed was not physical medication. They needed to turn to the word of God in order to see things clearly. What a difference it makes when we look at the world in the light of God's Word. Now, the next verse is, is wonderful, uh, especially when we consider what a spiritual mess this physically wealthy uh, church had become. Revelation 3.19, the Lord says, As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Now, the most common New Testament word translated love is the Greek word agape. Uh, that is a word that is, that is found in John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. It is a word of uh, compassion, a word of action. It's a word that talks about putting the beloved first and acting like that. But it's not the word translated love in Revelation 3.19. The word here translated love is phileo, a word that spoke of great affection one would have towards his family and perhaps very close friends. It is basically family affection. It is never said that God has family affection towards the world. He has compassion towards the world, but he does have family af affection toward his children, even his wayward children. Jesus, uh, speaking to his disciples, used the word phileo in John 16, 27, when he said, The Father himself loveth you because you have loved me and have believed that I came out from God. So here in Revelation 3, Jesus tells this wayward church, Because I love you as my family, I will correct you. I think anyone who's a parent can understand um, that you don't correct your children just to be mean or, or to just simply to deprive them of something. You correct your children so that they will learn and so they will be safe. And the Lord says, because I love you as family, 
I will correct you. And then he says, be zealous, therefore, and repent. In other words, knowing that Jesus loved them was a good reason to get excited. Knowing that he wanted to correct them and show them the better way was a good reason to take what they knew and act upon it. And that's pretty much what repentance is. When you know the truth, you choose to act accordingly. Um, it was it should have been an exciting thing then to line up their lives with his will because he loves his people. You know, there's no better place for a child of God to be than in God's will. Now, the next verse is rather thought-provoking. In verse 20, Jesus says to them, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him and he with me. Now, in the first century A.D., Generally, only the very rich had locks on their doors. Uh, we've already seen that this is a materially wealthy church. And it appears that their worldly wealth had led to them, figuratively speaking, locking Jesus out. Uh, of course, again, this isn't to be taken literally. Uh, the point is that through their choices, they had in a sense, pushed the Lord aside and treated him as if he were not welcome. Now, look at what he says. He says, if any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and, and he with me. Jesus says, we can have fellowship, we can have closeness, but you have to open up to me. Jesus says, if any man will open the door. Now, that's in the singular, and it's a reminder that it's possible for revival to start with one person. Now, now we often think about revival in terms of, you know, a big tent and uh, the preaching of salvation sermons and people coming to the Lord, and that isn't, that's a wonderful thing. Um, but in the scripture, when we come across revival, it's really like the, the waking up of God's people, uh, usually. So, if just one person in a church that's grown kind of stagnant, if just one person is willing to wake up, is willing to turn to the Lord and do His will, it could be the beginning of a waking up in that church. And so if you ever look at the church you are a member of and you say, boy, everybody's just got kind of lukewarm, then why not be the one who sets the example and leads the way in revival. Jesus is inviting anyone who will to be such a person. Um, finally, our section ends with these familiar words, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. The church in Laodicea had, apparently, become rather worldly, uh, focusing more on its worldly wealth and therefore distancing itself from the Lord. In light of this, let's be careful that we do not focus our attention on worldly things. Let's take to heart what Jesus taught in Matthew 6 and verses 20 and 21. He said, But lay up for yourselves treasure in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Child of God, we have no greater treasure than the Lord himself. Let's remember that. Let's be focused on him. Let's dig into his word. Let's delight that he loves us enough to correct us and teach us. And let's look forward to that day when we will be with him. And in light of the reality of his return, let's live for him and encourage one another to do likewise. Thanks for tuning in. Have a great day. God bless you.